All right, let's start with an opening prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for these minutes to study this material. And as we learn more about ourselves and our relationship with reality and understand how this works, may we strengthen our relationship with you. All in the name of Jesus, I'm free. Amen. Okay, we are in the book, The Nature of Personal Reality. We are in chapter 21. Um, we are in session 674. We are on page 416 at the bottom paragraph. Let's see, yeah. And it starts like this. In terms of time, evolution, as you think of it, emerging consciousness had come to the point where it delighted so in distinctions and differences that even in small geographical areas, multitudinous groups, cults, and nationalities were assembled, each proudly asserting its own individuality and worth over the others. So in the beginning, in those terms, man's emerging consciousness needed the freedom to disperse itself, to become different, to originate bases for various characteristics, and assert individuations. By Christ's time, however, some principle of unity was necessary by which this diversification would also experience a sense of unity and feel its oneness. Christ was the symbol of man's emerging consciousness, holding within himself the knowledge of man's potential. His message was meant to be carried beyond the times, but this interpretation is often not made. Christ uses parables that were applicable then. He used priests as symbols of authority. He turned water into wine. Yet many who consider themselves quite holy ignore Christ at the wedding feast and think any alcoholic beverage degrading. He consorted with prostitutes and the poor and his disciples were hardly men that would be called the city's fathers. Yet, many who consider themselves religious people hold on to respectability most of all. Christ used the vernacular of the times and in his own way spoke out against dogmatic ideas as well as temples that pretended to be repositories of holy knowledge but were instead concerned with money and prestige. Yet many who consider themselves followers of Christ now turn against the outcasts that he himself considered brothers and sisters. He affirmed the reality of the individual over any organization while still realizing that some system was necessary. His whole message was that the exterior world is the manifestation of the interior one, that the kingdom of God is made flesh. There are indeed lost gospels written by men in other countries in that time relating to Christ's unknown life, to episodes not given in the Bible. These formed a quite separate framework of knowledge that could be accepted by people who had different beliefs than the Jews at that time. The messages were given in other terms, but again, they reflected the affirmation of the self and its continued existence after physical death. Love was always stressed. One of the Gospels is counterfeit. That is, it was written after the others and the events twisted to make it appear that some of them happened in a completely different context than they did. Regardless, Christ's message was one of affirmation. And then uh, 
Jane in trance paused as I looked up questioningly. Questioningly, this is uh, who's writing it down. I was going to ask which gospel is counterfeit, counterfeit, because we're sure to get letters about that. And then Seth answered, it was not Mark's or John's. There are particular reasons why I do not want to specify now. Okay, I said, although somewhat reluctantly. At the time, Christ united man's consciousness in ways that reached out into history. The Christ consciousness was not isolated. I am speaking in your terms now. The same consciousness gave birth to all of your religions, therefore. The various frameworks through which the peoples of different times could express themselves and grow. In all cases, the religions began with the beliefs prevailing, spoke through the dictums of the times, and then expanded. Now this represents the spiritual side of man's evolution. The idea frameworks of psychic and mental life were far more important than the physical aspects as the species grew and changed. And that's the end of that session, and we'll go on and start session 675, which was dictated back on July 4th, 1973 at 10.20 p.m. on Wednesday. And if you ever get hold of one of these books of uh, The Nature of Personal Reality, you'll begin to understand that I'm reading basically Seth's words and skip over a lot of the notes that the uh, Seth and her, I mean Jane and her husband, um, well her husband basically writes these notes. And they're significant. They talk a lot about their personal lives. And this particular note is very interesting. But we will go on and start. And over on page 420, near the lower half, it says, Affirmation, then, means the loving acceptance of your own unique individuality. It may involve denial, where you refuse to accept the visions or dogmas of others in order to more clearly perceive and form your own. Such affirmation will lead you to your own inner discoveries and attract from the deepest portions of your being the particular kind of information, experience, or perception that you need. The loving acceptance of yourself will allow you to ride through beliefs as you would through the changing characteristics of a countryside. The more a belief encourages you to use your abilities and vitality, then the more affirmative it is. Rupert's perception is highly altered this evening, and this is an example of certain kinds of both affirmation and denial. He has always emphasized his own unique creative and intuitive processes. In so doing, he denied many of the concepts believed in by others. He accepted the belief that any consciousness could be in some kind of direct, intimate contact with experiences and realities usually not perceived, but ignored. He knew there were many different ways of experiencing even the physical world, and so he rejected all concepts that told him otherwise. The very belief allowed him to use those abilities, and as muscles became more resilient with use, so do psychic and intuitive powers. The legs run and leap over areas of ground. They cannot themselves interpret the reality beneath them. The feet are not aware of the ants they crush. They may feel the grass or sidewalk or the road, but the peculiar individual sensate life of the grass itself or of the ant escapes the feet which are involved in their own reality and concerned with these other things only in their relationship to feethood. The mind can interpret the experiences that the legs and the feet have, however, and by imaginatively using that sensual data 
can perceive the ant's reality to some extent. Now, when the mind races and runs, it sometimes has great difficulty interpreting its activities to the brain, which is usually concerned with other realities only to the extent that they impinge upon it. Rupert's mind is far more aware of other realities than his brain is, but he consciously believes in the greater reality of himself and his perceptions. The brain also possesses this belief, and so it opens itself as much as possible to the mind's activities. Because it does, certain intuitive psychic and, quote, intellectually spacious, unquote, experiences can be physically felt to some extent. The knowledge is interpreted through alterations in body sensation, which give it an important corporal validity. In such cases, high mental and psychic activity is reflected in the body's experience, providing a beneficial unity. Here I have used the term spacious for workings of the mind and intuitions that exist in what you might call an accelerated range of action. The normal intellect, oriented so precisely by beliefs to the inevitability of a one-focused kind of perception, is limited. A certain kind of affirmation of self allows the brain to tune into these more spacious methods of perception that are the natural characteristics of the mind. There are very good reasons why this type of assertion must first occur. The brain and the entire physical system is meant to ensure your bodily survival and to follow your conscious beliefs about reality. There is always a harmonious unifying connection between your beliefs and activities. Some people feel utterly confident in certain areas and timorous in others. Some aspects of life may be ignored or even refuted for a time while others are focused upon. The individual will very cleverly and shrewdly go ahead in those areas in which he or she feels safe, often when in the process of altering beliefs. You will not use your spacious mind until you affirm its reality within yourself and until you are ready to handle the additional data which will then become consciously available to one extent or another. But the spacious mind operates through your creaturehood. In your terms, it represents latent abilities of consciousness that can be more or less normal functions. There are built-in biological structures that are activated for the reception of such messages, and they have always been a part of your physical nature as a species. They will not be triggered on a personal basis until your own beliefs allow you to perceive the multidimensional layers of your own experience, or at least to accept the possibilities. As Rupert's episode tonight shows, even normal sense data then achieves a kind of multidimensionality, a richness rather impossible to describe. This automatically provides a biological learning process in which the senses can be used in a freer, deeper fashion. While such occurrences are not constant, they are frequent enough so that ordinary experience is changed. The richness overlaps. You do not have to know anything about so-called psychic matters necessarily. Many individuals use the spacious mind and its perceptions, taking it for granted without realizing how different their own perception is from that of others. Rupert wondered about this next matter which is related. Physiologically you carry within yourself remnants of your evolution in your terms, physical vestiges of organs and other attributes long discarded. You follow me here? Yes. In the same way, you also carry within you structures not yet fully used. Those organizations point, in your terms now, toward future evolution. Use of the spacious mind involves these. Individuals through all the ages have experienced this other kind of awareness, though no, never to its fullest form. Experience with the spacious mind dissolves 
any seeming conflicts that occur between the intellect and the intuitions at other levels. To whatever extent possible, the physical organism interprets that unity through a new mixture of sense data so that materially the information makes sense. An individual can tune into spacious mind operation two or three times in a lifetime without realizing it and have experiences that he finds difficult to interpret later. The affirmation involved is one of transcendence in which for a time, a person affirms his reality in flesh and, at the same time, states his independence from it. And he realizes that both of these conditions exist simultaneously. A dual perception takes place in which the spacious mind is activated. By, quote, activated, unquote, I mean that the physical organism is suddenly aware of the spacious mind's existence. We will stop there and we are going to focus on this last paragraph as far as summarizing up the information tonight. And the key word here is transcendence. Transcendence. All right, you'll come to your own understanding of what that means. However, what we're going to do is come up with a statement that uses transcendence in order to help us remember this material. What he is saying here is that we exist in physical reality and outside of it simultaneously. When we experience this in the spacious present and have a transcendent moment then we understand that we exist independent of physical reality we understand that we can survive death we begin to know that there is life after death and then that term tends to need to be altered because then we know that there is life before life and then we know that there is existence outside of physical reality right now. So the transcendence is the word that we're going to use that will say this in the statement. Transcendence confirms existence independent of physical reality. Transcendence confirms existence independent of physical reality. Transcendence confirms existence independent of physical reality. We will use that sentence and that will refer back to tonight's information. Today is uh, December 4th, 2013. And we'll have a closing prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this time to be exposed to these ideas. And may they help us lead to a more greater understanding of ourselves, our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with you. May it lead to us interpreting certain ideas in certain ways and allow us to experience life and maybe even if we can experience it in a spacious moment or have a transcendent moment however this works for us we thank you for exposing us to these ideas in order to help us lead a more richer and fulfilling life May we move towards this all harm-free, learning to love ourselves and those in our hearts and minds. In the name of Jesus, amen.